the scholar who, in sooth, does little else than handle books, ultimately forgets entirely and completely the capacity of thinking for himself. Even though Nietzsche turned from one of Schopenhauer's greatest admirers to one of his greatest opponents over the course of his intellectual career, in one aspect at least, he was always in agreement with his former mentor. It's not a good idea to read too many books. A brief passage in Ecce Homo is dedicated to the scholar, the type of person who spends his entire day reading books. Nietzsche would have been all too familiar with this type of person from his days as a scholar himself, when he was professor of philology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. With my own eyes I have seen gifted, richly endowed and free-spirited natures already read to ruins at thirty, and mere wax vestas that have to be rubbed before they can give off any sparks, or thoughts. Nietzsche's problem with reading too many books is related to overstimulation. By constantly reading books, you become dependent on their stimulus to formulate your own thoughts. In other words, you become a reactive being as opposed to a proactive being. When he has not a book between his fingers, he cannot think. When he thinks, he responds to a stimulus, a thought he has read. Finally, all he does is to react. The scholar exhausts his whole strength in saying either yes or no to matter which has already been thought out, or in criticizing it. He is no longer capable of thought on his own account. We can just as easily take this example of the scholar who's drowning in books and apply it to the modern day, with social media and our cell phones influencing our lives. If Nietzsche found problems with reading too much in the 19th century, then just consider what he would say right now. Consider, for example, the following sentence and how it applies to books as well as to social media. In him, the instinct of self-defense has decayed. Otherwise, he would defend himself against books. Or what about this sentence, about what a scholar does first thing in the morning? To set too early in the morning, at the break of day, in all the fullness and dawn of one's strength, and to read a book, this I call positively vicious. Do you reach for your phone the minute you're awake, first thing in the morning? Nietzsche would call your behavior positively vicious. Of course, we also know for certain that Nietzsche had around 1,100 books in his private library at the end of his life. And those books, they represent less than half of all the books he's read in his life. So make no mistake, Nietzsche did read a lot. But he warns against reading too much and becoming dependent upon books and the ideas of others to formulate your own opinions. In other words, he warned against becoming reactive in your thinking rather than proactive. The first is the hallmark of a critic, someone who takes another person's system and criticizes it. But the proactive thinker comes up with his own system and ideas, he generates original thoughts. Nietzsche doesn't attribute his inspiration to reading books. Quite the opposite, in fact. He states multiple times that his best ideas came to him while being out on a walk, while being physically active in the real world. For example, he famously came up with his concept of the eternal recurrence while looking at a rock during one of his hikes in the Swiss Alps. That day I happened to be wandering through the woods alongside of the lake of Silva Plana, and I halted not far from Surlay, beside a huge rock that towered aloft like a pyramid. It was then that the thought struck me. And the inspiration for Zarathustra as a character came to him while he stayed in Genoa, Italy. In the morning I used to start out in a southerly direction up to the glorious road to Zwagli, which rises up through a forest of pines and gives one a view far out to sea. In the afternoon, or as often as my health allowed, I walked round the whole bay from Santa Margareta to beyond Portofino. It was on those two roads that all Zarathustra came to me, above all, Zarathustra himself as a type. I ought rather to say that it was on these walks that he waylaid me. If we can take Nietzsche at his word in these writings, and there's no reason not to, that means that during this period of his life he spent around four hours per day hiking on the Italian coastline. When Nietzsche stayed in France for a while, he explored the countryside of Nice. Of those days, full of inspiration, he writes, during those moments when my creative energy flowed most plentifully, my muscular activity was always the greatest. The body is inspired. Let us weave the question of soul. I might often have been seen dancing in those days, and I could then walk for seven or eight hours on end over the hills without a suggestion of fatigue. I slept well and I laughed a great deal. I was perfectly robust and patient. And, of course, there is this famous aphorism in Twilight of the Idols. A sedentary lifestyle is a real sin against the Holy Spirit. Only those thoughts that come by walking have any value. This distrust of reading too much books and the encouragement to go on more walks instead is also echoed by Arthur Schopenhauer. Interestingly enough, while Nietzsche would later come to oppose everything Schopenhauer stood for, 
When it came to practical advice like this, Nietzsche was often in agreement with his one-time idol. In an essay dedicated to reading and books, which we covered on the channel in greater depth before, Schopenhauer wrote the following. The person who reads a great deal, that is to say, almost the whole day, and recreates himself by spending the intervals in thoughtless diversion, gradually loses the ability to think for himself. Just as a spring, through the continual pressure of a foreign body, at last loses its elasticity, so does the mind if it has another person's thoughts continually forced upon it. And just as one spoils the stomach by overfeeding and thereby impairs the whole body, so can one overload and choke the mind by giving it too much nourishment. Of course, just like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer read a great deal of books over the course of his lifetime. The problem is not so much with the reading itself, but reading too much and without having a pause to reflect on what you've just read. It is only by reflection that one can assimilate what one has read. If one reads straight ahead without pondering over it later, what has been read does not take root, but is for the most part lost. And what better way to assimilate what you've read than by taking a walk? Schopenhauer, according to his biographers, walked for two hours per day. And in his manual for the happy life, which he also covered here on the channel in greater depth, Schopenhauer devotes an entire paragraph to the importance of exercise and calls it the cornerstone of a good, healthy and happy life. He also warns against the dangers of a sedentary lifestyle. When people can get no exercise at all, as is the case with the countless numbers who are condemned to a sedentary life, there is a glaring and fatal disproportion between outward inactivity and inner tumult. For this ceaseless internal motion requires some external counterpart, and the want of it produces effects like those of emotion which we are obliged to suppress. And just like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer was fond of hiking in the mountains. In his youth, when he was around 15, he went on a tour of Europe with his parents. From his detailed travel diaries, we know for certain that Schopenhauer loved climbing mountains. At least on three occasions, he climbed mountains during the tour, the Chapeau, Mount Pilatus, and the Schneekoppe, and each time he was transformed and transfixed by the grand vistas that blended all small and particular things into a colorful panorama. Climbing mountains, and better yet, hiking mountains, thrilled the young Schopenhauer. And a few years later, when he was writing his dissertation at university, he lived for a while in a German village in close proximity to mountains and forests. Rudolstadt was surrounded by well-forested mountains, and he enjoyed the inexpressible charms of the region, and he took solace, as was his custom since youth, of hiking in the mountains and the Thuringian forest. Both of these philosophers spent significant amounts of their time and life outside of the house, away from books. While Schopenhauer went for a more moderate approach, integrating his physical activity in his daily routine, Nietzsche went for the intensity of doing one or the other in short bursts. Schopenhauer walked for two hours per day every day, right after his cold bath, and spent the rest of the morning writing. Then he read in the afternoon. Nietzsche went through intense periods where he was outside nearly the entire day, hiking for seven to eight hours per day for weeks on end, alternated by periods where he practically locked himself up to get his writing and reading done in very short bursts. He famously wrote Twilight of the Idols during one such flurry of productivity, having written the entire book in just a few days. This work, which covers scarcely 150 pages, with its cheerful and fateful tone, like a laughing demon, and the production of which occupied so few days that it hesitates to give their number, is altogether an exception among books. But the point is, these philosophers shared the idea that reading too much, and with that being sedentary or inside for too long, isn't healthy. Nietzsche's moments of inspiration came to him while hiking the Swiss Alps or when exploring the French and Italian coastlines. Schopenhauer believed in reading a book and then digesting it, so to speak, while taking a brisk walk. If we take the general idea here, meaning we don't focus on reading too much books, but rather look at the underlying problem with this, namely mental overstimulation, then I think that in the 21st century, we're all overstimulated. Nietzsche directed his ire at the archetype of the so-called scholar, the university professor who locks himself in his room and does nothing but read, until he can think for himself anymore. Schopenhauer pointed his critiques at the masses, who don't think about what they read, and constantly seek new literary stimulation in the form of the pulp literature that was exploding in popularity in Schopenhauer's day, like the equivalent of being glued to Netflix today. If the problem of mental overstimulation was big enough in the 19th century for these guys to dedicate some writing to it, then how bad is it today in the 21st century? And what has the impact been of this overstimulation on our society? Anyway, Hopefully this video can serve as some food for thought and inspire you to put down your phone and be outside more, 
and go take a walk and digest the info you've consumed. Have you been outside lately? When's the last time you spent an entire day in nature? Let's get a good discussion going in the comments. It's always nice to read them, and those of you who comment just for the algorithm, you're immensely appreciated as well. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe before you put the phone down and go for a walk. It helps out the channel a great deal and you'll be notified when we release a new video that way. A big shout out goes out to our Patreons who keep the channel going and who have access to a monthly exclusive video we do just for them. We appreciate you. And thank you for watching. We've done similar videos to this one, diving deep into Schopenhauer's ideas on how to read books and memorize what's in them, as well as a video on Nietzsche's autobiography, Ecce Homo. Again, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.